In this final lecture, I want first to return to historical messianism, but this time to explore universalistic forms of the post-millennial type. And I will begin with the messianism of Reform Judaism. To talk about the messianism of Reform Judaism might seem at first sight a contradiction in terms. Because surely the one thing that everyone knows about classical reform is that it negated messianism. I will argue that what it negated was not messianism per se, but a particular traditional outworking of the messianic idea. It retained the doctrine of redemption that is demonstrably within the parameters of the deep structure of Jewish messianism, and even more surprisingly, and this may be a bit controversial, some of the closest parallels to its position are to be found in the messianic doctrine of the early rabbinic period. Now, one of the joys of studying Reform Judaism is that in America, at least, where it took deep root, it was fond of issuing manifestos, which conveniently summarized its views at a given point in time. In 1824, the Reformed Society of Israelites in Charleston, South Carolina, published the Declaration of Faith known as the Charleston Creed. Though it contains only 10 articles, it was cast in the Anima Amin version of Maimonides' 13 Principles. And it is clearly meant to be taken as a rewriting of a well-known existing statement of faith. Article 9 reads, I believe with perfect faith that the love of God is the highest duty of his creatures and that the pure and upright heart is the chosen temple of Jehovah. And Article 10, I believe with perfect faith that the Creator, blessed be his name, is the only true Redeemer of all his children, and that he will spread the worship of his name over the whole earth. What is not said is as important as what is. The universalism is obvious. There is no reference to an individual Messiah or return to the land, no mention of resurrection of the dead. Instead, in Article 5, we have a pointed statement of the immortality of the soul. God will not dwell again in a temple made with hands, but in the hearts of the righteous, whether Jew or Gentile. <coughs> the Philadelphia Conference of 1869 declared, 1. The Messianic aim of Israel is not the restoration of the old Jewish state under a descendant of David, involving a second separation from the nations of the earth, but the union of all men as children of God and the confession of the unity of God, so as to realize the unity of all rational creatures and their call to moral sanctification. Two, we look upon the destruction of the second Jewish commonwealth not as a punishment for the sinfulness of Israel, but as a result of the divine purpose revealed to Abraham, which, as has become ever clearer in the course of the world's history, consists of the dispersion of the Jews to all parts of the world for the realization of their high priestly mission to lead the nations to the true knowledge and worship of God. Three, the Aaronic priesthood and the Mosaic sacrificial cult were preparatory steps to the real priesthood of the whole people, which began with the dispersion of the Jews and to the sacrifices of sincere devotion and moral sanctification which alone are pleasing and acceptable to the most holy. These institutions preparatory to higher religiosity were consigned to the past once and for all with the destruction of the second temple and only in this sense as educational influences in the past are they to be mentioned in our prayers. Five, the selection of Israel as the people of religion as the bearer of the highest idea of humanity is still as ever to be strongly emphasized. And for this very reason, whenever it is mentioned, it is only to be done with full emphasis upon the world embracing mission of Israel and the love of God for all his children. Six, the belief in bodily res resurrection has no religious foundation. And the doctrine of immortality refers to the after existence of the soul only. In 1885, 
a group of 15 rabbis issued the Pittsburgh Platform, the most important of the early reform manifestos. In this we read, fifth, we recognize in the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect the approach of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among men. We consider ourselves no longer a nation but a religious community and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship under the administration of the sons of Aaron nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. Sixth, we recognize in Judaism a progressive religion ever striving to be in accord with the postulates of reason. We are convinced of the utmost necessity of preserving the historical identity with our great past. Christianity and Islam being daughter religions of Judaism, we appreciate their mission to aid in the spreading of monotheistic and moral truth. We acknowledge that the spirit of broad humanity of our age is our ally in the fulfillment of our mission, and therefore we extend the hand of friendship to all who cooperate with us in the establishment of the reign of truth and righteousness among men. Seven. We reassert the doctrine of Judaism, the soul of man is immortal, grounding this belief in the divine nature of the human spirit, which forever finds bliss in righteousness and misery in wickedness. We reject as beliefs not rooted in Judaism the belief both in bodily resurrection and in Gehenna and Eden, hell and paradise, as abodes for everlasting punishment and reward. Eighth. In full accordance with the spirit of Mosaic legislation which strives to regulate the relation between rich and poor, we deem it our duty to participate in the great task of modern times, to solve on the basis of justice and righteousness the problems presented by the contrasts and evils of the present organization of society. From these short but carefully crafted statements, a co coherent <coughs> scenario of redemption emerges that goes something like this. Redemption will come when humanity, acknowledging the one true God, unites in brotherhood to establish the universal reign of truth, justice, and peace on earth. That day will come. There is a historical inevitability about it. The moral and intellectual progress society has already made shows that it is on its way. When that kingdom finally arrives, the Jewish people will merge with humanity at large. But till then they must preserve their particularity because they have under God a leading role to play, both individually and collectively, in bringing in the kingdom, in spreading the truth and in fighting injustice and wrong. And wrong. That role is a priestly role towards the rest of humanity, to keep pure and mediate the knowledge of the one to, to true God and to lead all humanity to his worship. Still more, it is a messianic role. There will be no individual messiah, rather the Jewish people as a whole will play the part of special agent of redemption. They are obliged to be active and to cooperate with anyone, Christian, Muslim, people of goodwill everywhere, who is working towards the same goal. Their mission is helped, not hindered, by their providential dispersion throughout the world, and to seek to reverse this, to gather the people back into the Holy Land and form them once more into an independent state like other states, to make a second separation between them and the nations of the world, would be to put the clock back and negate Israel's historic destiny. The national past of the Jewish people, along with the temple worship that went with it, was a phase in their preparation for their universal mission, but that phase has been forever transcended. The kingdom of peace, justice, and universal brotherhood should not be conceived of in two utopian terms. The dead will not be raised to take part in it. During the Messianic Kingdom, people will still die when they have completed their natural span of life. But their souls will live on with God, <coughs> though not in hell or paradise, as tradition teaches. This is the ultimate condition to which all humanity will come to live in eternity as disembodied souls with God.
Now, the first reaction of historians of Judaism when faced with such ideas in 19th century reform is to stress their modernity, their rootedness in 19th century European thought, with its boundless faith in progress and social evolution. It would be pointless to deny this influence, but what I hope should by now be clear is that these ideas are equally rooted in Jewish tradition and are a valid expression of the messianic idea. To repeat, the reformers were not rejecting messianism per se, but only a premillennial and particularistic version of historical messianism. What they sub substituted was a form of post-millennial universalism. The parallels with the 19th century liberal idea of progress cannot be used to negate the basic Jewishness of this point of view, because that idea itself was heavily influenced by Christian post-millennialism and by the vision of the just society set forth by the prophets of ancient Israel. So if the reformers were taking anything from liberalism and socialism, they were arguably simply claiming back what Judaism had given on loan in the first place. There are also, you will note, and this came up I think in discussion yesterday, some interesting and unexpected parallels between the reform view and that of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, which we briefly considered in the last lecture. There are, of course, differences, but note the agreement on one significant point, namely that an important role in bringing in the kingdom will be played by a multiplicity of human agents actively spreading the truth. The wars of the Lord are a battle for hearts and minds. This parallelism arises, I would suggest, for a very simple reason. Both messianic scenarios are post-millennial. This is not so surprising in the case of 19th century reform, but it is deeply puzzling, and this is what came up, I think, before, in the case of Chabad. Chabad had passed through the Shoah. Its sixth Rebbe had barely escaped with his life. And he had seen, he had seen the, the Shoah in terms of the birth pangs of the Messiah. That, one would have thought, would have turned Chabad Messianism decisively in a catastrophic premillennial direction. Under the seventh Rebbe, however, this does not seem to have happened. It took an unexpected postmillennial turn. There would seem to be some truth in the suggestion that Chabad Messianism of the 1990s should be seen as a messianism of prosperity and success rather than of persecution and failure. It is probably no accident that it arose like the reform scenarios we have just considered in America. That reform was still within the parameters of the messianic idea was masked by the fact that it was so obviously and emphatically rejecting the messianism of the Amidah. It illustrates a phenomenon which appears from time to time in the history of Jewish messianism, where a prevalent form of messianism is radically rewritten or modified. It is easy when this happens to assume that messianism is being suppressed and miss the fact that actually it is simply one form of messianism being substituted for another. Since there is clearly a chronology involved in such a development, in that one form is very consciously replacing another, one can also miss the fact that the later form of messianism may well have much earlier roots. And is not such a radical new development as might at first sight appear. Borrowing a term from Sholem, though not using it in quite the same way, I am minded to call these deliberate rewritings of earlier messianisms neutralizations. Reformed, reformed post-millennial universalism was a neutralization of the premillennial particularism of the Amidah, and it was not in essence, but it was not in essence an invention of reform. The Amidah was an old and exceedingly venerable part of the liturgy and many Reformed Jews were loath simply to throw it out. 
but its messiness imposed massive problems for them. And it is fascinating to tra trace how they try to modify it in successive editions of their prayer books. It's a wonderful uh, thing to do this. I spend a happy time trying to read all these different reform prayer books really, and seeing what they did with the Amidah. For example, Isaac Mayer Wise, one of the great leading American reformers of the, la of the 19th, uh, 19th century, posed as an alternative to the traditional wording of Benediction 10, Kibbutz Galoyot, the ingathering of the exiles. I quote, let resound the great trumpet for the liberty of all nations. Lift up the banner to unite them in the covenant of peace and bring them nigh unto thee to worship thee in truth. Very fine benediction. The Gates of Prayer, another uh, reform prayer book, has sound the great horn to proclaim freedom. Inspire us to strive for the liberation of the oppressed and let the song of liberty be heard in the four corners of the earth. This rewriting of the Amidah is not, by the way, confined to reform prayer books. One can find it happen happening with increasing frequency in Orthodox prayer books in Israel. For example, the Benediction 7 Geulah, um, in Benediction 7 Geulah Redemption, the Israeli prayer book Ha'avodah Shebalev replaces Redeem us quickly for the sake of your name with redeem us quickly with a complete redemption, Geolash Lema. This little change speaks volumes. It suggests Rav Cook's idea that the present state of Israel, while not the full redemption, is the beginning of the redemption. So we talked about this yesterday. So it's interesting, some of these, particularly in Israel, these reform prayer books tinker with the text of the Amidah. Reform has grown more particularistic in recent years as it became more traditional across the board. Reasons for this newfound particularism, the reason for this newfound particularism is not hard to fathom. It is a response to the rise of Zionism and the founding of the State of Israel. I cannot stress enough that political Zionism and the founding of the state carry enormous theological implications for Judaism, which no form of Judaism can ignore. By and large, reform has swung behind Israel, at least in support of its right to exist in peace and security. But how can it do this, given the radical universalism of its 19th century stance? The issue was carefully addressed as early as 1937 in the Columbus Platform. Again, a, a, an American statement of reform principles. Section 5 of this declaration under the title Israel reads as follows. Judaism is the soul of which Israel is the body. Living in all parts of the world, Israel has been held together by the ties of common history and above all by the heritage of faith. Though we recognize in the group loyalty of Jews who have become estranged from our religious tradition, a bond which unites them with us, we maintain that it is by its religion and for its religion that the Jewish people has lived. The non-Jew who accepts our faith is welcomed as a member of the Jewish community. In all lands where our people live, they assume and seek to share loyally the full duties and responsibilities of citizenship and to create seats of Jewish knowledge and religion. Now, listen carefully. In the rehabilitation of Palestine, the land hallowed by memories and hopes, we behold the promise of renewed life for many of our brethren. We affirm the obligation of all Jewry to aid in its upbuilding as a Jewish homeland by endeavoring to make it not only a haven of refuge for the oppressed, but also a center of Jewish culture and spiritual life. Throughout the ages, it has been Israel's mission, that it goes on, to witness to the divine in the face of every form of paganism and materialism. We regard it as our historic task to cooperate with all men in the establishment of the kingdom of God, of universal brotherhood, justice, truth, and peace on earth. This is our messianic goal very, very carefully, 
very subtly worded that. <coughs> now, those of you who know your Zionism uh, will, I'm sure, have spotted immediately how this declaration neatly inserts itself into the Zionist debate and takes its, sta its stand with the cultural Zionism of Ahad Ha'am. The state of Israel has to be more than just a political shell. It needs to be a place where Jewish culture and spiritual <coughs> life are developed. In other words, a place where precisely those values are fostered, which reform is working to disseminate universally among humankind. The state of Israel has to be a light to the nations. If anything, reform has become even more particularistic since 1937. Reform thinkers are perfectly comfortable with this shift because it fits in with their theological hermeneutics. Hermeneutically speaking, you can see them as a kind of Jewish Methodists. <laughs> to the theological resources of scripture, reason, and tradition, beloved both by the Anglican Richard Hooker and the great Rabbi Sadia Gaon, they add experience. And many reform thinkers believe that the experience of the Jewish people in the late 20th century in, in, obliges them to inject a stronger element of particularism into their theology of universal redemption. But where in earlier Jewish tradition can we find a similar configuration of messianism? I would suggest we can find it in a rather unexpected place, namely the messianism of early rabbinic Judaism. There too we find a neutralization of an earlier form of messianism, a political messianism close to that of the Amidah. And it was history again that dictated this move. The Jewish people, as I noted in the historical survey in my first lecture, went through a qu in quick succession two, possibly three, messianic wars. The first result, revolt of 66 to 74, the wars of Quietus of 115 to 117, and the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 135. The loss of life was appalling and finally convinced the rabbinate in Eretz Israel of the futility of armed revolt. They attempted to neutralize the messianism that had fueled rebellion and instead stressed the themes of personal fidelity to the Torah and individual salvation. To make a case for this thesis involves a complex piece of historical detective work and historical reasoning, with some of my, which some of my colleagues I know will strongly dispute. You have to unscramble rabbinic literature into its literary and historical strata in order to reconstruct the history of Messianism within the rabbinic movement from the fall of the Second Temple down to the end of the Talmudic era. That in itself, as you can well imagine, is a task dogged by academic controversy. I haven't the time here to go into all its twists and turns. I've argued my case on this point more fully elsewhere. Suffice to say here that if you look at the Tanaitic and early Amoraic layers of rabbinic literature, that second century CE um, down to the end really of the third century or towards the end of the third century CE, so from about 100 to, uh, sorry, from about, yes, 100 to about 280, uh, the um, Tanaitic and early Amoraic uh, layers of rabbinic literature then there is a conspicuous absence in, in the, those layers of any of the elements of historical nationalist messianism. This fact has long been noted by scholars, though they have disagreed as to what it means. This absence is all the more striking, given that, given that political messianism was part of the heritage of the rabbinic movement. Rabbinism, like Christianity, was an heir of the apocalyptic movement of late Second Temple Judaism. There are motifs of apocalyptic messianism scattered here and there in the Tanaitic and early Amoraic traditions, 
but they are lying around to borrow Jacob Neusner's vivid <coughs> simile like rubble from a building that has been demolished. Now, some argued that this absence of messianism is hardly surprising. The rabbis were focused on other matters. There was little occasion for it to arise. There's some force in this argument, but then how do you explain the upsurge of political messianism in later Amoraic strata when the rabbis are addressing the same broad agenda? Some would argue that it is wrong to treat the mission of the Tosefta, of the early Midrashim, and the early Amoraic traditions in isolation. They are not meant to give a complete rabbinic worldview. We have also to factor in the broader religious life of the scholars, and that surely involved prayer and festivals. We know the Amidah was around already in the Tanitic period, and it's surely hard to imagine a commemoration of the 9th of Av or even of Pesach without some element of Messianism coming in. Again, there is some force in this point, but not perhaps as much as its advocates often suppose. First, there is, as I suggested earlier, no reason to see the Amidah as in origin a rabbinic prayer. Though, as we saw, the rabbis may have tried to modify it for their own ends. They were an elite whose primary activity was the study of Torah. Prayer came a second, came second. And out of respect for the antiquity of the Amidah and popular sent sentiment towards it, they may have been prepared to tolerate it while not necessarily agreeing with all it said. The same approach might well have applied to the festivals. They certainly opposed the overzealous um, observance of the 9th of Av. This was probably not the first time, and it certainly would not be the last, that a religious elite behaved with indulgence towards the foibles of the masses while privately disapproving of them. And when all is said and done, we can't be sure what form the messianic benedictions of the Amidah would have taken in the late 1st <coughs> and 2nd century CE. As I noted earlier, their wording was not fixed, and this would undoubtedly have given scope to modifying their nationalism. Take the, rever the reference to the resurrection of the dead in benediction too. This appears to tie in with the reference to the resurrection of the dead in Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1. This famous Mishnah reads, all Israel has a share in the world to come, for it is written, Your people shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. And these are they who have no share in the world to come. He who says that there is no resurrection of the dead prescribed in Torah, and he who says that the Torah is not from heaven, and an Epicurean. Now, we must be careful here not to fall into an illegitimate totality transfer. That is to say, we, must, we should not simply assume that the reference to the resurrection of the dead here brings with it all the other events with which it is associated, for example, in Sadia's scenario of the end. It doesn't have to. It is possible for it to stand alone in an amillennial schema, linked only to the idea of the last judgment and reward and punishment in the world to come. This is the context in which it appears in Daniel. And it should be noted that it appears to be how this mission of passage is understood in the corresponding passage in Tosefta, Sanhedrin 13, 4 to 5. What you've got to understand is the Mishnah, there's two of these parallel law codes, um, the Mishnah and the Tosefta. Um, it's a big debate which comes first, but I hold to the view that in general the Mishnah is earlier and the Tosefta is later, as its title suggests, traditional title suggests. So, corresponding to Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1 is Mishnah Sanhedrin 13.4-5, but when you read one against the other, assuming that the Tosefta had the Mishnah in front of it, its reading of Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1 is absolutely astonishing. There, astonishingly, the world to come is not even taken as the eternal state beyond the days of the Messiah, but the post-mortem state when the soul is judged and given its eternal reward. 
This position is at best marginally amillennial. I'll return to this a little later. This raises in my mind the remarkable possibility that the Thersefta interpreted the resurrection of the dead in Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1, not as an event at the end of history when the soul is reunited with the body to undergo the last judgment, but the revivifying of the soul immediately after death to undergo the judgment of the grave, the Deen HaKever. On the Tosefta's view then, what the Mishnah is attacking are those who deny that there will be a rebalancing of the scales of justice after death. Add to all this the fact that there are grounds for arguing that benediction two of the Amidah was not originally about the resurrection of the dead at all, but about God sustaining life and taking it away. And the initial clarity of the situation begins to blur. We really must avoid jumping to conclusions. We must curb our enthusiasm for harmonizing. It is deeply uncritical. My argument thus far has been negative. It involves muddying the apparently clear waters and showing that there are ways of understanding the absence of explicit, explicit messianic reference in early rabbinic tradition, other than simply supposing that messianism was taken for granted. But for me, the clinching argument is that when you look at early rabbinic theology as a whole, you can see it developing and stressing ideas which have the effect of neutralizing political messianism. One might have thought that if it was worried, if it was worded anything like it is now, then there were sufficient safeguards against political activism built into the Amidah, if that was what worried the rabbis. This apparently was not enough for them. They felt they needed stronger arguments to dissuade potential hotheads, arguments that turns pe people's thoughts away from political messianism altogether, that deflected them into other channels. As with Reform Judaism, it would be a mistake to think that they were rejecting messianism per se. Rather, they were substituting one form of messianism for another. So long as we adopt a narrow Sholemian definition of Messianism, we simply won't see this. Messianism cannot be isolated from the total theological worldview. It is part of a package, and other parts of your package will inevitably configure your Messianism. What then are the ideas which I see being stressed in the theology of early rabbinic Judaism which have the effect of neutralizing political messianism? Let me pick out three almost at random. The first is a classic statement of realized eschatology. The state of blessedness that one expects only to be achieved in the future can be achieved here and now. Quote, Rabbi Chalafta ben Dosa of Kafar Hananya said, if ten men sit together and occupy themselves with Torah, the Shekinah rests among them, for it is written, God stands in the congregation of God. And whence do we learn this even of five? Because it is written, and has founded his group upon the earth. And whence even of three, because it is written, he judges among the judges. And whence even of two, because it is written, then they that feared the Lord spoke one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard. And whence even of one, because it is written, in every place where I record my name, I will come unto you, singular, and I will bless you. Mishnah Pirkei Avot 3.6 we are so used to this famous saying that it fails to register how extraordinary it is. Experiencing the divine presence, the Shekhinah, is surely the ultimate description of the redeemed state. The Shekhinah traditionally was God's indwelling in the temple, and it was experienced collectively by Israel. 
Here the claim is boldly made that through the everyday study of the Torah it can be experienced here and now even by an individual. There is no need to wait till the end of time when the temple will be rebuilt. Stress on the here and now is typical of much of rabbinic literature of this period. It raises the obvious question, what can an end time redemption add to this? The focus on the individual should also be noticed. Much early rabbinic tradition focuses on the individual and their personal salvation. A second tradition is precisely concerned with the working out of your own salvation. It is the famous dictum of Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair in Mishnah Sota 9.15. Heedfulness leads to cleanliness, cleanliness leads to purity, purity leads to abstinence, abstinence leads to holiness, holiness leads to humility, and humility leads to the shunning of sin, and the shunning of sin leads to saintliness, and saintliness leads to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit leads to the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead shall come through Elijah of blessed memory. Amen. This tradition has traditionally been taken as setting out a path of spiritual discipline, which will lead in the end to salvation. This is how it was interpreted by, among others, the Jewish Sufis, and by Moses Chaim Lutzato in his famous treatise on Jewish ethics, the Mesilat Yesharim. To possess the Holy Spirit is to have achieved a condition of prophecy, which presumably is taken to symbolize a privileged and blessed state of communion with God. That in turn leads to the resurrection of the dead, which will be brought about by Elijah. Now, this certainly looks eschatological and it might well be I am not suggesting that the early rabbis totally negated eschatology but again I would urge caution we can't be sure what the resurrection of the dead here means nor should we assume that Elijah comes in because he is the eschatological forerunner of the Messiah it is more likely he gets mentioned because he raised the dead and was widely seen as a model of the ascetic life. This is very typical of the Jewish Sufis of the Middle Ages, Elijah is their great hero. Again, the individualism is astonishing. The final tradition I will mention is Mishnah Pirkei Avot 4, 16 to 17. Rabbi Jacob said, this world is a vestibule before the world to come. Prepare yourself in the vestibule that you may enter into the banqueting hall. He used to say, better is one hour of repentance in this world than the whole life of the world to come, and better is one hour of bliss in the world to come than the whole of life in this world. There is a notable stress in early rabbinic tradition on the concept of the world to come, not in the sense of the days of the Messiah, nor of the eternity that lies beyond them, but of the post-mortem state of the soul. The righteous soul, if it has prepared itself in this life well, will experience bliss pictured under the image of a banquet, <coughs> the Jewish equivalent of the Christian beatific vision. Again, one is left asking, what can the days of the Messiah possibly add to this? If eschatology is implied, and I'm not denying that it might be, then surely it has got to be post-millennial. The kingdom will be brought in by each person working out his or her own salvation. There doesn't seem to be much scope here for an individual messiah of whatever stripe. Now, there could be no doubt that political messianism did re-enter rabbinism. It had never been lost in non-rabbinic tradition within the rabbinic milieu. It had continued in the Amidah and pulse possibly also in synagogue PUT, synagogue um, poetry. But the early rabbis had striven to neutralize it. I cannot analyze here in any depth the reason why rabbinism re-engaged with this form of messianism in the later Amoraic period. A few notes will have to suffice. suffice. The re 
engagement probably had something to do with the political and possibly the, the, with the political and possibly economic situation that was worsening from the Jewish point of view. From the later second century, sorry, it should be later third century to the mid fourth century, the Jewish communities in Palestine appear to have enjoyed, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> I'm correcting them now. From the later second century, that's from about 180, through to the mid to late third century to about 280, the Jewish communities in Palestine appear to have enjoyed a period of peace, prosperity, and relative stability under their own leader, the patriarch, for whom was claimed Davidic descent. The claim is suggestive. How could one be looking for another descendant of David if one was already present and leading the community? Hotheads would, could always argue that so long as Israel did not have complete political autonomy, she remained in exile, even though resident in her own land. But sensible people would be inclined to agree that this was just about as good as it was likely to get. In the fourth century, however, the condition of the Jewish communities in Eretz Israel worsened dramatically. Not the least of their troubles was the fact that the empire went over to heresy and heretics, led by Constantine's mother, began aggressively to appropriate the Holy Land as Christian holy space. But conditions in Palestine can't be the whole story because some of the earliest and most substantial messianic material in rabbinic literature is found in Babylonian layers of the Babylonian Talmud, particularly in Bavli Sanhedrin. When this messianic material begins to appear, it is of a decidedly premillennial complexion, suggesting it may have arisen out of crisis. The influence of the Amidah on it is very clear and very striking. But though they re-engage with political messianism, the rabbis were still implac implacably set against political activism. Indeed, they attempted to turn the messianic yearnings to their own ends by maintaining that the only legitimate way to bring the Messiah was through repentance and the study of Torah. I began my lectures on an abstract level with a preliminary attempt at defining the messianic idea in Judaism. We then immersed ourselves in some messy and complicated detail by considering some concrete messianisms which represented in a fairly pure form three types. The historical nationalist, the mystical, and the historical universalist. I would like to round off my analysis by turning, returning to the general level again and presenting a more comprehensive taxonomy of Jewish messianisms. And here we have a handout. So I did not pass this out earlier because you've spent all your time <laughs> fiddling with it. I have set this out on the handout. I would stress that it is tentative, it still needs a lot of work, and if any of my learned colleagues have any suggestions for improvement or criticisms, they will be much appreciated. Now those of you, and I'm very glad that Alex is here, that those of you that know the mighty organon of the Manchester Durham typology of anonymous and pseudepigraphic Jewish literature, will immediately notice a similarity between it and my taxonomy. And Alex was the great theoretician of uh, the inventory of uh, this Manchester Durham typology project, which is just coming to an end. Like the Manchester Durham typology, my taxonomy is corpus-based and derived in principle from the total corpus of messianic traditions in Judaism. And so it is synchronic. But unlike the Manchester Durham inventory, it lists not literary features, but motifs, topoi, ideas. In this respect, it could usefully be compared with Stiff Thompson's motif index of folk literature. These messianic motifs are presented in many different literary forms. There is no single messianic literary genre, 
though narratives and thematic aggregates lend themselves readily to the presentation of messianism. The earliest statements of the messianic idea take the literary form of fresh revelation. This is the case both in the prophetic writings in Tanakh and in late Second Temple Apocalyptic, which is pseudepigraphically attributed <coughs> to great figures from the prophetic past before prophecy cease. This apocalyptic mode of discourse continues in the text of the apocalyptic revival of the 6th to 9th centuries, but within the rabbinic tradition, a different style of presentation was favored, <coughs> one that is more overtly metatextual, that relates each claim made, as much as it can be, to an explicitly quoted biblical proof texts. text. This is what we find in Sadia. As we saw, Saadia's hermeneutics do leave a role for reason and tradition, in his case, rabbinic tradition, in constructing his eschatology. But the impression he sets out very deliberately to create is that his scenario of the end is all in scripture, is all in Tanakh. At times, his scenario becomes little more than a mosaic of biblical quotations. The implication is that all the separate statements about the end of history scattered throughout Tanakh are pieces of one and the same jigsaw. What Sadia has to do is to find out how to fit the pieces together to reveal the total picture. If you're interested, by the way, in a literary profile of a predominantly messianic text, I would refer you to the entry under 2 Baruch, a late sec first century CE apocalypse, in the Manchester Durham database. Now, as you will see, if you've got the taxonomy in front of you, it is based on a distinction between the messianic idea, by which I mean the deep structure of Jewish messianism defined by four cardinal and interlocking theological propositions, and messianisms which are the outworking and concrete scenarios of the different possibilities inherent in the messianic idea. Messianisms can be profiled, classified, and compared on a grid defined by time, scene, agency, and scope. And I distinguish three ideal types, the premillennial, the postmillennial, and the amillennial. I have indicated the inventory points which classically define these types. There are other inventory points which are compatible with these basic ideal profiles, though not essential to them. Some inventory points are mutually exclusive and contradictory, and a messianism, if it wants to be co coherent, and by no means all do, should not take both. Other inventory points, while not formally contradictory, stand in strong tension with each other. And if both are ticked, then problems of coherence can arise. Actual messianisms often include elements from more than one of the ideal types, usually because their framers are trying to harmonize diverse messianic traditions which they have received. <coughs> when the profiles are heavily mixed, I call them hybrid. Hybrid messianisms can be highly creative as their framers struggle to find ways of overcoming the contradictions and tensions within their inherited traditions. And the more powerful the tensions, the more creative they have to be. The ideal types function like a scalpel to help us delicately to separate what may look at first sight indistinguishable points of view and to discover nuances which might otherwise get overlooked. Take, for example, the, prominent, the problem of imminence v. non-imminence, profile points 1-4 and 1-5. I see 1-4 imminence as fundamental to premillennialism and have listed as part of the ideal, listed it as part of the ideal profile. None imminence 1.5 is common in postmillennialism, but I have not put 1.5 into the ideal profile of this type 
because there will come a time in every post-millennial scenario when the end is imminent and it will be perceived to be so. It will come when all the conditions that must be fulfilled before the kingdom arrives have been deemed to be fulfilled or almost fulfilled. We saw that there was a powerful sense of imminence in the post-millennialism of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And a similar though less intense feeling pervades, pervades the post-millennialism of 19th century reform. Recall the wording of the Pittsburgh platform. We recognize in the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect the approach of the realization, the approach of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among men. The fact is that both pre- and post-millennialism recognize signs of the end, but they're very different signs. The pre-millennialists look for catastrophe and disaster, the post-millennialists for progress and improvement. One outlook is, pe is pessimistic, the other optimistic. And in both cases there is room for doubt. Are things ghastly enough for the premillennialists to start listening for the footsteps of the Messiah? Are they favorable enough for the postmillennialists? <coughs> so you get completely opposite points of view, but both have this concept of something that is te will tell us that the end may be at hand. Our detailed discussion has focused on pre- and post-millennialism and said little about amillennialism. Let me comment briefly on this form of messianism just to complete the picture. Amillennialism in its purest form negates the detailed historical scenarios of pre- and post-millennialism. There is an end to history, but it is marked simply by a universal resurrection, a last judgment, and the consignment of the damned to hell and the saved to heaven, where they, will be, where they will respectively suffer eternal punishment or eternal bliss. This scenario is massively complicated by the problem of the intermediate state. <coughs> what happens to us between death and general resurrection? In some forms of the doctrine of the intermediate state, the person does not retain any consciousness after death. He or she, body and soul, sleeps in the dust, till awakened body and soul by the power of God at the resurrection to face the final judgment. But from Second Temple times onward, some within Judaism held that the soul retains consciousness after death in another world, and resurrection then consists of it being reunited with its miraculously reconstituted material body at the end of time. This post-mortem existence became more and more vivid and busy in certain strands of thought. The soul does not exist in a condition of suspended animation, but if it is righteous, it enjoys bliss in a place of blessing and joy, and if wicked, suffers torment in a place of punishment. This logically entails a post-mortem judgment, a judgment of the grave, to decide who is righteous and who is wicked. The more developed this post-mortem existence of the soul becomes, the more tension it generates with amillennialism. What is the point of having a last judgment if the judgment has already taken place? What can it add if after the last, the last judgments, soul are again returned to Gan Eden or to Gehenom for which they have been from which they have been dragged, so to speak, before the judgment seat? This post-mortem scenario can be configured as an almost totally realized form of amillennialism. I say almost because one could argue that until history has ended and all the souls that God intended to be born have entered the world, lived righteously or unrighteously and been gathered back to him and the material world has finally been wound up, the intermediate condition of any soul can hardly be deemed to be eternal. 
So long as the end of the temporal world is predicated, we are still, I think, within the parameters of the messianic idea, but only just. We are fast approaching the vanishing point of messianism. Several concrete messianisms do integrate into their messianic scenarios the intermediate state, and this is why we need to have the intermediate state somewhere in our taxonomy under scene. You will find it under 2.2. But it doesn't have complicated things. You might well ask why anyone would screw up their messianic scenario in this way. The answer is simple. They found it in sources which they regarded as authoritative. Religious tradition often starts out as separate streams on the hillside, streams which people later try to channel into one clear flowing river. The doctrine of the immortality of the soul and the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead are a case in point. They arose in different places for different theological reasons and bringing them together generates considerable tension and requires considerable ingenuity. But this doesn't stop people trying. This then is my basic taxonomy. There's one criticism of it that will, I imagine, spring to everyone's lips. It is that I've included too much. What I've presented is a schema that embraces effectively the whole of Jewish eschatology. In a sense, I have, but I can't see any way around this. The alternative, Sholem's position, is effectively to limit Messianism to those historical schemas of the premillennial type which have a personal Messiah in them. But these should not be taken out of context. Sholem has created a massive petitio principii, having decided that the only Jewish view that can merit the title messianic <laughs> is historical premillennialism. He then proclaims this is normative Jewish messianism. There is one last thing I feel I have to do. Throughout my lectures, I've been aware, as I suspect some of you have, recall Sophie Garside's question after the first lecture, of an elephant in the room. Though I have nodded towards it occasionally, I feel it would be pusillanimous if I were to end without addressing it head on. The elephant is, of course, Christian messianism. Where does Christian messianism fit into the picture? Messianism is the key issue in the Jewish Christian controversy. Does my analysis have anything to contribute to this controversy, any light to throw on Jewish Christian dialogue? I would cautiously suggest that it may have some. One, I think, one thing I hope will now be settled is that Sholem's neat distinction between the political messianism of Judaism and the spiritual inward messianism of Christianity <coughs> simply does not hold water. The historical fact is that all the different types of messianism which I have discussed can be found on both sides of the religious divide. Christianity, even at its most spiritual, has continued to look for an end to history and to expect redemptive manifestations in the everyday world. There is a well-established tradition of Christian eschatology which integrates Jewish political messianism into its Christian scenario of the end. It looks for a restoration of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland and their reconstitution as an independent state. The influence of this idea on Christian messianism has increased in the past 150 years with the spread of dispensationalist premillennialism, nowadays called, often called Christian Zionism. One possible implication of the fact that the full range of the taxonomy of messianism is manifest on both, within both traditions is that it becomes more difficult for either side to delegitimize the other's messianism as in principle inauthentic. Because the form of messianism that is being delegitimized will be found on one's own side of the fence as well. 
There is a classic Jewish anti-Christian argument, which is somewhere I sense in the background of Sholem's famous essay, that not only was Jesus not the Messiah, but the sort of messianism attributed to him is not authentically Jewish. That view might be maintained as a matter of faith, but it is hard to maintain it as a matter of history. Judaism and Christianity really do share the same messianic idea, and both have embraced the full range of possibilities that that idea proffers. This narrows down the debate to one key issue. Is Jesus of Nazareth the long-expected Messiah? This is not a question that I can ask. <laughs> it's way beyond my pay grade as a mere professor of religion. It cannot, of course, be answered in objective academic terms. In the last analysis, it is a matter of faith. Perhaps it will only be finally answered when the Messiah himself comes. If and when that happens, I hope I will merit to be among those who are there to greet him. As he rides into Jerusalem, I will approach him like a BBC foreign correspondent and ask him, Sir, is this your first or your second visit? <laughs> Till that day dawns, if ever it does, there is much in my view that Jews and Christians can do to explore in a spirit of mutual respect their shared messianic worldview. Much they can do to purge their eschatologies of all that is negative and harmful. Much they can do to bring a vision of hope and purpose to a troubled world. Thank you. <laughs>